Welcome to the newsroom. I'm Owen Poindexter, senior writer at Front Office Sports. This is where we break down the biggest stories in the sports world, and not just what's happening on the field, but what's happening behind the scenes, in the business world, in the culture world. And in this episode, we are gonna be diving into the world of college conference realignment. We are in the middle of a seismic shift in the college sports world. We, No one knows where it's going, even the people in the middle of it clearly don't know where it's going, but we've got one of our top reporters diving into this and really getting the play-by-play, blow-by-blow, and we're gonna be getting a behind-the-scenes look on what's going on in this fascinating drama that is shaking the entire college world right after this. 2000, 2008, 2022. When it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. Dot-com crash, housing crash, and the roller coaster we're going through right now. One thing is certain, it's a dangerous time to not know your numbers. But over 31,000 businesses have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, and budgeting, so you can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins, everything you need all in one place. So how do you prepare for uncertain times? The answer, NetSuite. NetSuite helps you identify rising costs, automate your business processes, and easily see where to save money. That's why 93% of customers said they improved their visibility and control when they upgraded to NetSuite. What are you waiting for? Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash the newsroom right now. netsuite.com slash the newsroom. netsuite.com slash the newsroom. All right, let's get into it. Today, we are talking about college conference realignment and the Shakespearean drama that is unfolding right now with all that. Joining us to do that is our expert on the topic, reporter Amanda Kristovich. Hey, Amanda. Hey, thank you for having me. So, a lot to get into there. First, I just want to touch on basically what we did our last episode on. We had AJ Perez on, and he has been doggedly pursuing the the Brett Favre story. So, I'm actually just going to read uh, a little snippet of one of his more recent stories on that because Brett Favre was in trouble last week. He is in even more trouble this week. And I should just say we're recording this on Monday. It's going to come out on Thursday. So it's totally possible that like he's going to like have charges against him or you know something else horrible is going to come out in the next couple of days. But just to uh, to update everyone in case this is your main Brett Favre news source. So the, the first couple of these are relatively old news. But we've got Favre lobbied for $5 million from TANF funds. These are funds intended for the neediest people um, to build a volleyball center at the University of Southern Mississippi, his alma mater, and where his daughter played the sport at the time. Favre received $1.1 million from the same source, again, intended for needy families, for speeches and radio spots he didn't do, also a violation of the narrow ways TANF money can be spent. Favre repaid the money, but White, um, as an attorney, said he still hasn't paid back more than $200,000 in interest. And in a September, this is the doozy, in a September 23rd court filing, more texts from Favre show that he lobbied for $1.5 million from the state's welfare agency to build an indoor practice facility in an attempt to lure Dion Sanders' son, Shador, to play at Southern Miss. In the same texts that were part of the filing, Favre suggested using prison labor to keep costs down. Yikes. Um, and like, Brett, you know, Brett Favre didn't invent prison labor, but wow. Um, <laughs> I don't really have much to add on that other than wow. Um, but man, I mean, if he somehow gets out of this without, you know, prison time or without like losing all his money, um, I, I hope like no one's going to be employing him to like do anything public. I mean, he was, you know, a popular person that would, could do commercials before all this. And, uh, hopefully at least that is his like public punishment, even if he doesn't get a, um, you know, prison time, which he totally could. Um, we also, uh, AJ and I, um, had an unintentionally prescient conversation about CTE and concussions in the NFL. Um, and again, the episode came out uh, the day of the... Uh, Dol- Who are the Dolphins playing? Uh, I don't even remember. Um, the Miami Dolphins game in which uh, two other quarterback, their star, uh, had a horrible injury where he had to be carted off the field. The follow-up... Um, uh, uh, medical evaluations seem to be positive in um, in a good way, 
but uh, still super, super scary. And now uh, a, a conference person, uh, Bill Pascrell of New Jersey, uh, wants, wants answers about this. And so anyway, AJ and I were talking about how everyone's kind of forgotten about CTE mm -hmm. and concussions in the NFL. There was such a huge issue before. Now it's kind of, now it seems to be flaring up again um, because the issue itself seems to have not gone away. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the issue far from saying it hasn't gone away. I mean, um, clearly the quote unquote strides that have been made are being called into question at this point. Um, and I'll just add that from the college sports perspective, um, there's a lot of medical evidence to suggest that you don't have to make it to the NFL to develop a lifelong brain trauma. So there are plenty of players out there who have been studied, who have brain injuries from only playing college football, never making it to the pros. Um, so this is a big issue in college sports as well. It's about to get bigger. There are many, there have been, are, and will be many lawsuits um, in the future because um, the NCAA in general does not exactly have the greatest track record on health and safety policies, um, liability, health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an issue that is going to continue to trickle down the football food chain in this country. Yeah. And along those lines, care to tell us what you'll be up to next week? <laughs> yes. So <laughs> next week, I, um, we, I will be covering a lawsuit, a wrongful death lawsuit against the NCAA, it's going to be tried in California. And um, it's going to be very interesting to see. Uh, I, I read the complaint. Um, it, it's going to be very interesting to see sort of um, whether or not the NCAA can argue that they're not liable for, um, you know, these lifelong injuries that athletes incur, particularly when part of the argument is that the NCAA knew that this was a possibility and, and didn't educate players. Um, the player in question who, who passed away, unfortunately, um, he played, I believe, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and his story is really quite tragic. And it's, uh, it's also indicative of a lot of players who played in the pros, um, a lot of the CT stories that we've heard. Um, and so this, like I said, this issue is not going away. It's only getting bigger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a grim topic, but it's, it's an important one. And, you know, we, now there is a concussion protocol at least, but clearly it's, it's not doing everything that needs to happen. Um, all right. So let's, speaking of college, let's get into our main topic of the day. So the college conferences, I called it a Shakespearean drama a moment ago. It, there, there is... Uh, the, the forces are realigning. I think if we fast forward a few years, like, we will have some clarity on this, but things are shifting um, right right now. And they're shifting before our eyes on a kind of week by week, month by month basis. Uh, the, the power dynamics of a couple years ago are totally being upended. So if you could just set the scene for us, mm -hmm. wh where should we start this whole story of, of realignment and power shifting? Uh, just in, in terms of the timeline, where do we begin where the previous status quo starts to change? Yeah, so I would take us back to last summer. Um, <laughs> the summer where I took lots of vacation because of the <laughs> Alston decision, NIL, and then conference realignment. Just kidding. That was sarcastic for anyone who's <laughs> not looking at my face right now listening to this podcast. Um, so I would take us back to last summer when um, Texas and Oklahoma, who are in the Big 12, announced that they are ditching the Big 12 for the SEC in 2025. Um, they are two of the powerhouse um, marquee brands from a business standpoint um, in the Big 12. And so that was you know, a big issue. At the time, there was sort of concern that um, the Big 12 itself was going to unravel without um, the TV revenue that these two schools were going to bring in. There was a lot of bad blood. Um, the former Big 12 commissioner, Bob Bowlesby, pulled a lot of uh, sort of stunts in the media to try to antagonize the SEC, ESPN, ESPN, SEC denied said allegations, etc. But what it set off was this chain reaction of like, OK, these two schools are going to the SEC. Great. Now the Big 12 has to turn around and say, all right, we've got to find schools so that we can replenish the um, sort of brand power that we've lost. Right. 
Um, so they turned around and they grabbed four schools, three of which were from the AAC. Then the AAC turned around and said, now we've got to grab a bunch of schools, right? And on and on and on the dominoes fell. And by the way, I will just tell you that um, they've continued to fall even down to lower divisions, which I believe we're going to get into later. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. And then, of course, this summer, USC and UCLA decided that they're leaving the Pac-12 and they're going to the Big Ten. And that also, in my opinion, was a direct reaction to um, the SEC beefing itself up. Yeah, so that all makes a lot of sense from the, the conference perspective. Why, what's in it for the schools? Why are they all hopping around? Yeah, the schools want TV money. Um, so the, um, the media rights contracts are uh, you know, more lucrative than they've ever been. Um, as I reported, the Big Ten's newest media contract is um, going to bring in, you know, in aggregate in the mid seven billion range. Um, and that is the largest by far conference wide media rights package in the history of college sports. And that media rights package, part of the reason it's so big is because it factors in USC and UCLA joining the big 10, right? So USC and UCLA are going to get a big chunk of that revenue. And Commissioner Kevin Warren said that the first year they join, they're getting the full, their full share, their full fair share of uh, the conference media rights deal. Um, and so that's what all of these other schools are doing. They're looking for an opportunity. First of all, they're looking for an opportunity to either stay or get into the Power Five. Because um, as a university president said last year, um, who it was escapes me, but it was during a, um, it was during a hearing a Texas state Senate hearing on the future of college football in the state, which just tells you everything you need to know about priorities. Right. Um, and, uh, they said everything is better in the power five, whether it be in the athletic department in the research, um, sort of academic side of the institution, that's just what their research tells them. So everyone wants to be in the power five. Um, there are some other sort of things floating around like, some conference or some school athletic directors tried to say, oh, well, this could help us with NIL, like give our athletes a bigger platform, more brands might be interested in them. That sort of remains to be seen, I think. Um, but really, as per usual, it's all about the money. Yeah. And, and so now we're entering this world where we've got the SEC and the Big Ten as mm -hmm. like the two Super Big conferences. ones, the, the super yeah. conferences, as, as everyone likes to say. Um, I feel like the Super League did that. Now now everything, <laughs> once you've achieved like the, the next level up, you are the super whatever it was. Yeah. All right, so we've got the two super conferences. Is there, is one big super conference bigger and richer than the other? Or is that kind of remains to be seen? Or what, yeah. yeah, the Big Ten is going to be richer than the SEC as things stand. Um, if the <laughs> SEC can beef up its media rights package, um, you know, that that's one thing. But the Big Ten, um, absolutely. I mean, look, the SEC dominates in the college football playoff. That's changing or that structure is changing, though, by the way. There remains to be seen whether the, um, you know, the, the champion will change. But um, the Big Ten uh, is going to make more money in its uh, conference media rights contract than the SEC for sure. OK, so we, we've got those big two and then we've got the remaining three of the power the five three <laughs> yeah, right yeah which which you know feels so dismissive especially if we jump back in time a year or two it's like mm -hmm. what you, yeah um so let, let's get a, a feel for that uh so it sounds like the big 12 is kind of the most okay of the remaining three even because it would it it got you know a serious wound losing its, yes. its two biggest school or were texas and oklahoma it's two biggest would mm -hmm. you say or well i mean in terms so, of in, in terms of brand value of money. yeah money yeah, yes yeah. um yeah yeah, yeah. I, I would say the you know the big 12 is is in a pretty decent position right now and uh the conference has outgo or former now a uh, commissioner bob bowlsby to thank for that he really um i mean he saved it um you know one of the schools that they're getting is cincinnati which you know, is not currently a power five program, but they were a group of five program that made a four team college football playoff last year. So when you give them power five resources, think about how much 
you know, more impressive they're going to be theoretically, right? Um, so I think they're set up pretty well. They have a new commissioner, Brett Yormark, who has a lot, uh, sort of an interesting background in terms of um, sports business. He um, seems to be very forward thinking about um, building a, the conference's brand, um, sort of extending it to younger audiences. He's talked about that he wants, he, he's looking at new schools. He said the conference is, quote, open for business. They're looking at schools in the West. He is, um, you know, seems to be very bullish on media rights negotiations. Um, so I, I wouldn't say they're, that the Big 12 is safe. But I would say that they they appear to have a pretty concrete strategy, um, if that makes sense. And then yeah, and it sounds like there's going to be a Big Twelve in the next five years. If you know, yeah, we could, you know, jump to twenty thirty or something, the Big Twelve is probably still going to be a thing. Right, and the Pac twelve, um, you know, could be in better a better situation. Um, they are also negotiating a new media rights contract early. Um, they you know, are losing their two, two, arguably two biggest football brands, um, money wise, they're losing, you know, in the LA market, which is a huge TV market, obviously. Um, but they also have sort of a, um, well, George Klievkov, the commissioner, I mean, he's not new in the last couple months, but he's a new commissioner as, as far as the history of the power five goes. And, um, you know, I mean, he's, he's coming out swinging too. He's also negotiating a new contract he, I mean, he came out in his press conference at um, Pac-12 Media Days talking about, you know, how he's been warding off, he's been fighting with the Big 12, and the Big 12's trying to tear them apart, and he's trying to keep them together. And by the way, I, will, I, I, I believe the AP poll that I saw yesterday had five Pac-12 teams in, in, in the top 25, obviously two of which are USC and UCLA, but like, four or five teams. Anyway, the point is, is that they are, um, there are good brands in the Pac-12. There are potentially, I think, opportunities for growth there. Um, it's, you know, it's just a question of the media rights contract. Um, and then we have the ACC, which, um, I would say is, I think there's a consensus that it's in its weak, in the weakest position because its media rights contract is the least lucrative of all five. And it goes, um, you know, for like a decade. So there's, you know, not a lot of negotiating power, not a lot of opportunity to, um, you know, sort of bring in new members, up the rights, renegotiate, think about streamers. Um, So that, that, that would, the the media rights issue with the ACC is the big, biggest red flag um, to me for them. But I will say, and this is something that a lot of experts have pointed out, that it's also possible that a conference's stability is dependent upon like the fact that no one other, no other conferences want the schools in that conference. So it's like, if no one wants the ACC schools, it's good. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Rather ironic, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Makes some sense. Um, Yeah. And so of those, those three, the PAC 12, the ACC, the big 12, there's all kinds of chatter around at least two of those coming together. And, we were just chatting before we hit record that um, those conferences are being super cagey about Absolutely, whether yes. that's even on the table, uh, how much they're talking about, how serious they're talking about it. Um, so, yeah, do you think it's going to happen? Do you think it makes sense? And yeah, yeah, give us give us your feel on that one. Yeah, um, it's hard to say whether or not I think it's going to happen um, because... You know, I've I've asked these conferences for comment about, you know, there was a report um, uh, there. There was a local news report that found text messages um, among UNC officials about whether or not the ACC should consider a merger with the Pac-12 and the Big 12. There's been chatter about this. There was the alliance last year. If you remember that, that wasn't a merger. But people sort of said, could it turn into one? Um, And. Those text messages, you know, didn't necessarily suggest that anything was being explored at the conference level seriously. Um, I asked around. Uh, the Pac-12 declined to comment. The Big 12 did not respond to comment. And the ACC just referred me to previous comments by Commissioner Jim Phillips, who basically said, you know, we're exploring our options, um, which I think is fair. I think it's a bit strange, frankly, that um, no one even wants to sort of 
correct the record about the seriousness of these conversations, but I guess they all have their reasons. Um, for, for lack yeah, of I mean, a better I word, be surprised I, mean, I don't know. Maybe they don't know how serious the conversations are themselves. Like, yes. you know, it takes two to tango yes. and, you know, they have to see what their media deals are going to look like. They, they right. have to get a feel for like, can we draw in more schools? Right. You know, and, if we just let the musical chairs shake out, you, where do we sit here? Right. And, and, and the money aspect of it too, is I think the, the answer to the question of how likely, you know, is it? or like how beneficial is it, right? Because there's two things that need to be considered with this. The first is travel. So if you're gonna merge two conferences that have lots of schools all over the country, the Big Ten, uh, USC and UCLA are gonna be dealing with this. The gargantuan cost of travel, that is a major consideration, regardless of how much money you're making in your media rights deal. And then the second question is, you know, I'm no math whiz, but you need to be able, when you're realigning a conference, when you're adding new members, you need to be able to ensure that the value that those schools are going to bring in is greater than the dilution that they will cause when they're splitting all of the revenue from the conference with more schools, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. if you have 14 schools and let's say each of them get Fifty that or fifty million dollars, right? If you add two more schools, they better have a big value proposition add, money wise, so that they're not diluting that fifty million that every school gets, right? So if you're yep. going to merge a conference, you're going to double the number of schools. That's a lot of math to figure out. You know, I'm right. I'm happy that no one's calling me to ask me to figure that out. <laughs> but yeah, right, and it makes sense. Um, and the travel part of it's interesting to me. I, mean, I was kind of chuckling when I was looking at those those reports around the Pac-12 and ACC maybe thinking about merging because they were like, well, it would be called like the Pacific Atlantic Conference. It's like, yeah. Those... <laughs> so like the everything <laughs> there's a, conference? There's a country in the middle of those. I you mean, know. you know, um, that's basically what the Big Ten is, you know, from UCLA to yeah. Rutgers. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and I can see sort of the media appeal that you get to hit a lot of different markets. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so... I guess the the overarching narrative, perhaps, is that the we're shifting from these conferences being based around geography to just media deals and, and what's going to get them the most money. Yes, absolutely. That is for sure um, an extremely astute observation on your part, um, <laughs> <laughs> and one that not a lot of people are happy about. You know, because I think yeah. that college football is a crazy sport it's such a weird cultural phenomenon it's so unique to the united states these you know these rivalries are so um there's so much history behind them you know and um i i think that it is it going to collapse college football of course not right um everyone's always saying everything's going to collapse college football and nothing ever does but um it, you know there are definitely a lot of fans who who are who are not thrilled um, about the sort of idea that um, conferences are going to be based, you know, largely on, you know, media deals and sort of American League versus National League, ver you know, as opposed to the, the regional um, sort of structure of, of your, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, one thing, so I'm in the Bay Area, I'll make it out to a Giants game once in a while, and one thing I kind of love about Giants fans is they will break out the Beat LA chant against, you know, like the Padres. Like, yes. they just, you know, if they get tired of, like, taunting the team they're actually playing, they'll be like, well, we, we always have LA. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, to, like, pull up out or those regional uh, rivalries, you know, I I'm sure they will find ways to get people excited about, you know, whoever they're playing, new rivalries can develop over time, but, you know, there is a history here. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can understand that being a bummer. And also I can understand, um, the, the conferences themselves just seeing the short term monetary gain and not worrying too much about like, are we cutting off this long term narrative that we have so that we can cash in on our next big media deal? Because the next big media deal is like the next big thing for like any league these days. It's like, Absolutely. are we going to get, you know, a hundred billion, fifty billion. Like, like the, the stakes are huge, right. um, so I understand. But it, it's uh, it, 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 it's sort of um, it can get 
turn things into a sort of more ahistorical or yeah, you're, you're cutting off history. Yes. Um, um, is there room for a third big conference or given the size of the big 10 and the sec, are they going to be the big two with no room for a big three unless like maybe the other three all gang up on them? Yeah. I mean, I wonder if the big 12 could be that, um, that would be sort of my, if I were, you know, if I were to take a bet, I wonder if the big 12 can pull that off. Um, you know, but again, with the media deals, it's like SEC and Disney versus the Big Ten and Fox, um, and mm-hmm. NBC and, you know, CBS, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really like Disney and SEC versus ESPN or versus, um, sorry, versus Fox and the Big Ten. And, and, you know, it's like, those are the powerhouses. Um, yeah. and it's, you know, I think it's going to be hard to rise to that level. And there's one other wrench that I'll throw into things for you, right? Which is um, the question of what FBS football governance is going to look like in the future, just on the aggregate. I mean, um, it appears right now that the athletic directors at least are in favor of keeping FBS football under the NCAA, keeping the structure uh, sort of as is. By the way, which is a structure where... um, the sport itself is technically governed by the rules of the NCAA, but the playoff is run by a separate entity, um, which is sort of one of those things where we just accept it because it is the way it is. But if you think about it, it's really bizarre. Um, right, and if you were starting over, you would never do it that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, why? What are? Yeah. Um, but there, you know, there's been lots of talk about does Power 5 break off? Does FBS football break off? You know? Um, and so in that scenario, like, then what does conference realignment look like? Does any of this matter? Like, I'm not sure. So that's just yet another sort of small, but actually very large wrench to throw into what these conferences are going to look like in the next five, 10 years. And I wanted to throw one more wrench into this whole situation. Of course. Because we don't have enough wrenches. Um, Paying players. So we got NIL, right? That That's mm-hmm. obviously been another seismic shift in the right. college landscape. One we talked about a couple episodes ago. You should tune in, everybody. And um, But we've also talked about how NIL might just be the beginning. We might just have players yeah. getting paid for their, their labor mm-hmm. uh, sometime this decade. How is that if, if it happens? And even if it doesn't happen, we still have players getting more power, more ability to make money. How does that factor into all this stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there seems to be a consensus. There was a great piece in The Athletic the other day um, that sort of the reporting that I've done, I I think I agree with what the consensus of that article was, um, which was that college sports administrators not only recognize, but many of them are in favor of giving athletes more benefits than they're currently getting. Does that mean salary? Does that mean better health care? Does that mean yet bigger scholarships? I'm not quite sure. Um, But the one thing that they do not want to do is have athletes become official, quote unquote, legally deemed employees. They all want them to get more money. Kevin Warren has said that he is interested in continuing the dialogue about athletes getting a chunk of media rights revenue, for example. I mean, Jim Harbaugh talked just a couple weeks. He said multiple times that he thinks that um, the football players should get a chunk of the next media deal because they're the ones creating the product that everyone else is making the money off of. But does that come as like kind of like an NIL deal, like a licensing deal, um, you know, joint licensing deal with the networks and the conferences and the schools and the players? You might need a union for that, but that's another story for another day. Um, Or... Does a court, does the National Labor Relations Board, does a legal Congress, a legal entity decide that the players are employees? And at that point, it's like the conferences don't have a choice. Like right now, I think the Big Ten and the SEC, again, this is total speculation, right? Just to mm-hmm. be clear. But just based on the amount of money they will be making, it makes the most sense for the Big Ten and the SEC to have the resources to pay players. Um, But whether you have the resources or not, you got to follow the law. So if the law changes, 
they're all going to have to figure it out. Yeah. And that's how NIL started was, right. you know, first California, actually my state representative uh, in the Senate uh, passed a bill saying uh, players are, you know, but we'll be able to um, access NIL money. I think I forget, starting in 2024 was the original bill. Anyway, that set up a whole cascade of other states kind of yep. getting in and then eventually the Supreme Court just opening the floodgates. Um, all right. So we should wrap this up. But what should we be watching for in the near term in terms of like next domino to fall type stuff here? Yeah, well, I'll just I'll just mention um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, this is a story I feel like, you know, the money isn't as big, so no one's talking about it. But it's really interesting. And it's that all this conference realignment has trickled down to the lower divisions to the point where there is opportunity to move up whether it be from Division Three to Division One, Division Two to Division One, or FCS to FBS within Division One, And um, a, there are 16 schools this year that are currently somewhere in that process. It's a multi-year process of applying to move up in divisions. But it has given a lot of these lower division schools an opportunity to move up if they, if they want to. Um, whether that is a good idea or not, I think remains to be seen. Can those schools be successful? Can they um, sustain themselves? Are they going to be entering into a Division One that they, by the way, don't even know what it's going to look like because the NCAA is like redoing Division One? Um, but that is another sort of domino to this um, that the big schools moving up has sort of opened up opportunities because conferences need a certain number of schools, right? to keep going. So the conferences are seeking out schools too. So that's, I feel like, you know, it's unfortunate that no one is talking about um, that because it's like a lot of people don't care about anything outside of FBS football, but here at front office sports, we, uh, we try to be <laughs> equal opportunity for all of uh, all divisions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it sort of speaks to just like where this whole thing started is like, everyone yeah. wants to like, you know, go for the top, you know, yep. <laughs> they want to be the biggest. Um, and if you can't be the biggest, then you, you know, you poach from the second biggest, uh, and on down the chain. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, fascinating stuff. It, it's, I like these stories where we are in the middle of a mercurial mass that we, <laughs> <laughs> we know where it started. drama is truly just like exactly how to describe it. You know, if, yeah. if they want to do a succession spinoff where, you know, like they, it's, it's like about like, you know, college football conferences like that. I, I would watch that. Just saying. Yeah. And like, I, I'm sure that show, I don't know who's going to do it. I don't know, you know, what it's going to look like, but I think one thing we can predict pretty accurately is that that show will exist in the next like three years. Yes. Um, all right, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us. Fascinating stuff. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for tuning into the newsroom. We'll be hitting these conversations every single week, really getting inside how sports is affecting the business world, the economy, the culture, everything around us. So you're not going to want to miss an episode. Tune in on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can even check us out on YouTube. And please subscribe, rate us, review us. It really helps other people. It takes a few seconds for you. makes a big difference to us. And we love the feedback. I'd love to know how these conversations are hitting you, what you'd like to hear more of. So oh, please tune in next week, and we'll see you then.